Hello everyone. Today we are starting with a new chapter and this is a chapter of environmental impact assessment. So before moving to the chapter, let's try to understand what is its role in your examination. First of all, probably in your prelims examination, there is no direct role. And even in the prelims syllabus, we have not seen any mention of it. And in the past papers also, there hasn't been any question that has come in the prelims examination from this chapter. But when it comes to the mains examination, Mains is where you can consider this chapter to be of utmost importance and especially given all the controversies around draft EIA notification of 2020, it becomes all the more important for at least next coming two or three years of time. So we need to understand what is the meaning of environmental impact assessment and just remember that this is a topic which is more important from your means point of view as compared to the prelims examination. So when we talk about the environmental impact assessment, you have to understand that if you talk about any country, let's say if we talk about India, we know that there are certain things which are very, very important for the growth and development of the country. Whether you talk about the agricultural sector, you talk about the industries, you talk about urbanization. In all these cases, you know that for the development, whether you talk about development of the society or economic development, in all these cases, you need certain steps to be taken. You need multi-purpose projects. So when you talk about these, these all are steps which will help in either economic development or societal development. But at the same time, although it looks like all these projects are good for the growth and development, there is the second side of the coin as well. And the second side that we are talking about is the impact that all these projects would have on our environment. Now, if you talk about the impact, the impact can be on various levels. For example, you can talk about the impact on air. You can talk about the impact on water, the noise levels that it might have, the destruction of biodiversity that can happen. So there are multiple levels of problems that can arise at an environmental level. And this is where something like environmental impact assessment comes into the picture. Because you need to take care of all these aspects if you are trying to go with a new project. If there's a new project which is being proposed in an area, there is... There should be certain steps that should be taken beforehand so that we ensure that there is not going to be a big destruction of the environment of that given region. And it is in this context that environmental impact assessment becomes very, very important for us. So, for example, let's say if we take an example, the picture that you see on your screens is of the Great Indian Bustard. Now, Great Indian Bustard, if you go by the reports that have come in the past couple of years, we now know that there are fewer than 150 Indian bustards which are left. And if you look at the data of 1969, where from we compare it, the numbers were more than 1200. So all of a sudden, we have seen that there has been a drastic drop in the population of Great Indian Bustard. That is a drop in population by more than 90%. So there are programs that are running, there are steps that are being taken so that conservation of this species can happen. IUCN Red List says that this is a critically endangered species. Right? Now, with all this given, there is another side. If you look at the habitat where it belongs today, it's mostly Gujarat and Rajasthan and parts of Maharashtra. Especially when we talk about Gujarat. Gujarat has a lot of potential with respect to wind energy. It is always seen as a better way of getting energy as compared to the non-renewable resources like coal, petroleum, etc. Right? So in comparison to that, we always know that wind energy is going to be a better alternative. Not only this, we also know something that India has a plan of creating an installed capacity of 175 gigawatt by 2022. Right? This is a plan that we have. And out of this 175 gigawatt, 60 gigawatt of power has to come from wind energy. So a lot of steps are being taken to ensure that we are able to reach the target. Now, when it comes to these kind of energy sources like wind energy, we know that wind energy being a better or a cleaner alternative to the fossil fuels will always be promoted by the government. So this has happened in India as well. But there is a flip side that we have seen to it. Now, when it comes to wind energy, because of the fact that it is a cleaner fuel, it is something that is being promoted by the government. It is something which is seen as a better 
alternative as compared to the fossil fuels when it comes to the environmental impact assessment normally environmental impact assessment is not done for these kind of projects so when it comes to any wind energy infrastructure that is being built it will not have to go through rigorous environmental impact assessment looking at what kind of problems it can cause and this is precisely where we look at a major problem there was one study that was done back in 2012 done by researchers from Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History now when they did this research what they found out was that because of the wind capacity that has been built in Gujarat and the infrastructure projects which are ongoing because of that there are a large number of bird kills that are happening if you look at the reports of last couple of years even 2017 to 2020 report says that there have been more than 50 bird kills that have happened only because of the wind turbines not only this what we have observed is there have been a couple of deaths that have happened of the great indian bustard now great indian bustard being one bird which is critically endangered where the population is lesser than 150 and it can very soon be categorized as extinct in the wild we have to take utmost care of it and that is something that has not happened when it comes to wind energy there are programs that are running there are steps which are being taken to save this species but nobody has ever tried to look at wind energy and we don't want to look at because what alternative do we have because if it's not about wind energy then the sources that we have could be something like coal or petroleum so instead of having something like coal or petroleum we would always prefer that something like wind energy is being used so this is where there is a dichotomy that is being presented that whether we should go for these kind of energy sources we, whether we should let it run without any problems or there should be some checks and balances here also and even as I said that there have been controversies with respect to the draft 2020 notification one of the points that was also raised was with respect to the wind energy turbines that are there steps that could be taken which will help in considering all these kind of points now it's not that the government has not been taking steps for example if you look at the notification that had come out in February 2019 by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy they also have now started to look at the marine ecosystem they had said that any new project that is being taken even for offshore wind power even in those cases it needs to be ensured that they are not harming the marine ecosystem at the same time the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy as well as the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change both have come out with certain guidelines with respect to how to handle the wind power in these kind of areas which are very critical to the survival of Great Indian Bustards. So there are things that are happening, there are steps that, that are being taken but at the same time there has to be a comprehensive study about the impact that all these kind of things can have. And when it comes to this chapter, this chapter is precisely about that that when it comes to environmental impact of any project what are the kinds of things that we need to look after what are the kinds of steps that are, have to be taken and what is the entire procedure about so first of all if we start with the basics environmental impact assessment what is the meaning of it so it is the process of identifying predicting evaluating and mitigating the biophysical social and other relevant effects of developmental projects prior to major decisions being taken and commitments made so this is just one of the definitions there are many definitions so there is no official definition of it this is one of the definitions that comes out so basically when we look at environmental impact assessment the words itself give you a hint that we are doing an environmental impact assessment of an environmental impact that a project can have whether positive or negative and if negative what are the negative effects how disastrous can it be should we go ahead with the project or not is there a way in which these kind of effects that might happen can be reduced can be completely stopped so all these are the kinds of things that we have to understand so the evaluation needs to happen the prediction needs to happen the identification of these kind of issues needs to happen and ultimately the mitigation strategies should be there all kinds of issues whether we talk about the biophysical issues the social issues and all the other relevant effects that these kind of project can have on a given region so 
this is how environmental impact assessment is seen so let's say there is an upcoming project let's say there is a coal mine that has to be made in a given area so if a coal mine has to come up what are the kinds of things that the coal mine can have for example the coal mine can cause a lot of air pollution as well as a lot of water pollution it can also lead to land pollution in the nearby area so we know that there will be these kind of problems apart from that forest areas might have to be destroyed because we need to make the mines at those places and because of the mines coming up at these sites these areas will lose a large amount of their forest ecosystems so is there a negative impact that will happen on the entire region the ecosystem the organisms that is the plants and animal species living there all these kind of assessments need to be done and this is where the role of environmental impact assessment comes into the picture now let's try and understand what is the need of an environmental impact assessment and here you have three major areas that you need to understand first basically it is to identify predict and evaluate the economic environmental and social impact of any given project so first is to identify the problem this is the first thing then the second part is to provide information on the environmental consequences of decision making that is and at the same time to look at the steps that can be taken so that any kind of negative impact that we were looking at with respect to the given project that can also be mitigated then after that the third part is basically to promote environmentally sound and sustainable development through the identification of appropriate alternative and mitigation measures and more importantly basically to look at how it can affect the given region in a positive manner so these are the three things that becomes of utmost importance for any developmental project that you take so that's why there is a requirement of eil so for example let's say there was no environmental impact assessment in that case first thing you will never come to know what was the environmental impact that it could have had plus at the same time what societal impact it could have had you will never come to know and if there is a possibility of a positive impact then definitely you don't know about it so that's why we need to take care of these aspects and that's why there is a need of an environmental impact assessment before any project starts so when you look at the environmental impact assessment you have to understand that it's not only about providing the clearances because whenever we look at eia it's mainly about providing the clearances we think of the clearances being provided to these kind of projects but you have to go beyond that you have to think beyond that you have to think in terms of what kind of impacts a project can have and what are the ways in which we can look at a positive impact on the environment and society and try to understand and look at each and every possibility of the same so that's why you have to understand what is the need of an eia then after that if you try to understand what are the objectives that an environmental impact assessment will try to fulfill first we will divide it into short term and long term goals if you look at the short term goals first it is to understand the possible impact of the project then the public participation and this becomes a very very important point that public participation in the decision making and design which are more publicly acceptable should be looked upon so that's why you will see that in any eia process there will be a window that will be given for public participation as well and especially for the people who are living in that area their voices also should be heard and their voices also should be a part of the decision making process so that's why this becomes a very important short term goal that we have then after that to assess the potential loss or damage to the biodiversity the natural habitat and the cultural heritage sites if there is any so all these kind of things have to be understood and that's why the first thing that it will try to fulfill is to look at all the negative impact that this kind of a project could have then to look at all the mitigation plans to minimize the negative impact through appropriate measures for example let's say there could be a requirement of clearing of forests so if there is such a requirement we have to try and see how the minimization can happen and we'll have a couple of case studies towards the end where you'll understand these points but we need to understand that if let's say there was a felling of 5 lakh trees that 
would have happened for a project can we do the same thing by felling just 3 lakh trees instead of 5 lakh can we save 2 lakh trees from felling off so these are the kinds of things that we always need to look upon then to facilitate the decision making and setting of the terms and conditions for implementing the post project monitoring so when it comes to these projects and we'll have a discussion on this very aspect also the post project monitoring so any kind of monitoring any kind of assessment that will happen after the decision making has happened after the construction of let's say a new project has started and after the establishment of the entire project has happened because even after the establishment it's not that the environmental impact assessment is not carried out you will see that there will be an evaluation that will keep on happening from time to time so that's why we need to facilitate all the terms and conditions at this very juncture before the project has been taken up before the project has been built so that's why this also becomes a short term objective of environmental impact assessment and then if we start to understand all the long term objectives that an eia would have first would be to try and escape from irreversible and irrevocable damage to the environment so if we understand all the problems that could happen because of a given project we will know what are the kinds of steps that need to be taken in a way that the project can be carried out sustainably then to increase the social dimension of the project proposals involving the sentiments the health and safety of the people and the development of the community so public participation one of the short term goals that we had discussed in long term you can say that yes if you look at from the point of view of society then the participation of society in ensuring its health in ensuring its well being becomes of utmost importance and that's why for the community for the people who are living there in that region it is very very important that there is a public participation then it becomes an instrument for sustainable development right because let's say if there was no eia then in that case you don't know how the project owners will behave let's say if it's a private entity or even a public entity you don't know how they behave there might be a possibility that they will always try to maximize their profits and maximize the manufacturing etc from a given project as such but at the same time looking at the sustainable development becomes very very important so if eia is done then there are checks and balances in place and then in that case we will be able to look upon the things in a much more sustainable manner and so there again you have a long term benefit that a project will have if eia has been done on time before the start of the project so these are some of the objectives of eia now let's try to understand the eia process how exactly is an environmental impact assessment done so if you look at the screen the steps that you see are the basic steps that are taken now the number of steps that you are looking at this is not an official step you will see that various reports whether in india or outside whether governmental reports also you will see that there are slight differences in counting the number of steps that they have but normally this is how it is done so basically what happens is the number of steps that you are looking at is not actually defined but this is how the flow goes so for example when you look at any eia process what will happen is first of all we'll have to understand whether or not there is an eia which is required if eia is not required the project can directly start but if it is required then in that case in what sense is it is required what kind of impacts are we looking at for which eia needs to be done then after that we need to understand the strategies to mitigate these kind of issues that may arise then the impact management of the same needs to be done after that you will see that there is a final report that will be presented and before this there will be a public consultation also that will happen and once public consultation has happened then there will be a revised draft which will be put forward and once it has come out then finally there will be a monitoring that can happen later on so basically we are looking at the same number of steps that it will start with understanding whether or not it's required and ultimately the project can or may not start many a times it will not start so one by one let's try to understand these processes and try to see how exactly the entire process goes so first thing that we have is screening now when we talk about screening screening is something just like whether it's a yes or no do we need an environmental impact assessment or we don't need it now we took the example of wind energy that wind energy is something that is seen as a green source of energy and that's why 
it will perhaps not require an assessment. So most of the times you will see that whether it's wind energy, solar energy or any of the renewable energy sources, these kind of projects will directly be said to not have any kind of environmental impact. So they will be excluded from the assessment. So at the time of screening, this will come out as a no. That screening is not required. But let's say it's a coal mine. Then in case of a coal mine, we know that there can be a lot of environmental issues that can arise out of it. And that is why you'll see that these kind of cases will always go to a why. So when we talk about screening, so first of all, it says whether or not there is a requirement to conduct the screening and screening needs to follow specific procedures often described in the legislation so that all the projects follow the same process. So for example, you can have a look at all the questions that are listed on the screen. These are not questions which are important from your examination perspective. You don't need to know any of these questions at all, but just for your reference, what kind of questions are asked, what kind of questions needs to be addressed before scoping can be done or we can move to the next stage. These are the questions. For example, will there be a large change in the environmental conditions? Will new features be out of scale with the existing environment? Will the effect be unusual in the area or particularly complex? Will the effect extend over a large area? How many people will be affected? Will valuable or scarce features or resources be affected? Then is there a risk that environmental standards will be breached? Will the effect continue for a long time? So there are so many questions. I mean, there are various agencies which have listed out various questions that can be addressed. So this is just a list of all these questions. This has been taken directly from what European Union follows. European Union has a set of 17 questions and these are the set of questions that they follow. And if the answers to most of these questions is no, then in that case, the screening will happen. But after that, they will not move to the next stage. The project can directly start. So this is how it is done in Europe. In India also, you will see that there are certain very similar standards which are followed. There is no official set of questionnaire that is followed, but more or less it is along the same lines as you can see on your screens. So this is the first step which is called as screening. Then comes the second stage and this is called as scoping. So if we have decided after screening that we need to conduct the environmental impact assessment, then comes the second step and this is the step which is called as scoping. So when we talk about scoping, this is a step which identifies the issues that are likely to be of most importance during the EIA and eliminates those that are of little concern. So for example, let's say I have a proposal for a coal mine in the forests of Chhattisgarh. Then in that case, what do we know? We know that there are very dense forests in the Chhattisgarh area. Apart from that, we know that it's an area which has good biodiversity. We know that it is an area with very clean environment, very clean air and water and we have a couple of water bodies in the surroundings. So there is a scope of water pollution, there is a scope of air pollution, there is a scope of environmental degradation in general, there is a scope of loss of biodiversity. So these are the things that are being looked after. So that's why scoping looks at the scope, looks at the range of issues looks at the different kinds of problems that can happen, that can arise if that project has been taken up in that area. That's why this becomes a very, very important step. So it is a systematic exercise that establishes the boundaries of your EIA and sets the basis of the analysis that we will conduct at each stage. So if you look at what exactly it involves, it involves identifying all the relevant issues and factors, including cumulative efforts, social impacts and health risks, then facilitating meaningful public engagement and review, determining the appropriate time and space boundaries of the EIA, how much time the EIA should take, all these kind of things will be decided here, identifying the important issues to be considered in the EIA, such as set, setting the baseline and identifying the alternatives. So these are the kinds of things that are involved when it comes to scoping. So basically here we are looking at the scope of problems and trying to define all the problems, define the timelines, define how much time the EIA should take. And if at all we see that it is going to be a very risky affair, then in that case, what are the alternatives that we can look after? So all these kind of things are involved in this particular stage that is scoping. Now the next step that comes up here is impact assessment and mitigation. So there are basically two sets of words that we are looking at. One impact assessment and then there is mitigation. So when we talk about impact assessment, 
this is basically assessment that is looking at all the detailed evaluations of the environmental and social impact of the planned project and to identify alternatives compared to the baseline condition now this is something that you need to understand whenever we talk about eia this word baseline condition will always come into the picture so when we talk about baseline conditions we are actually talking about the present scenario we are talking about the present scenario and how exactly the region where this project has to be undertaken how exactly does it look currently what are the social aspects of it what are the environmental aspects of it what kind of wildlife are found here what kind of plants trees are found here what is the quality of water found in these areas so each and every aspect whether you talk about the environmental aspects or you talk about the social aspects all these will be taken into account and these kind of conditions are called as baseline conditions so the impact assessment that will happen will be done on the baseline conditions that is depending that is compared to the present scenario what exactly would be the impact on this particular region after this project has been taken up whether it's a positive impact or a negative impact any kind of impact will come into the picture here so this is about impact assessment then after that the second part of it is mitigation so when we talk about mitigation it is something that refers to minimizing or avoiding the described impacts so first impact assessment was done we looked at all the scenarios we looked at all the problems that can happen all the issues that can arise out of the project being taken and then the mitigation comes into the picture that what can we do to reduce these problems what can we do if possible to avoid these problems altogether so this is the mitigation part so when you talk about mitigation the key focus of the mitigation action will be on preventive measures that avoid the occurrences of impact and thus avoid the harm or even if possible produce positive outcomes then after that take the measures that focus on limiting the severity and the duration of the impacts that will be caused and then finally to look at the compensation mechanism for those who are getting impacted due to this project so for example let's say if there is a rehabilitation which is required from this particular area then rehabilitation should happen in a proper manner whatever livelihoods are being lost by these people who live in these areas they should be amply compensated with they should be given alternate sources or they should be relocated at a place where they can find similar livelihood and they can live a similar life so all these kind of things have to be done and that's why compensation mechanism also comes into the mitigation strategy portion so this is the third step involved here so many a times you will see that this will be taken as the third and the fourth steps that is impact assessment being one step and mitigation strategies being the second step so more or less as i said the entire process remains the same the number of steps the counting of the number of steps vary according to various sources that you might look upon so then the next part that we have is impact management so impact management basically is the creation of a series of plans and protocols aiming to manage or monitor the identified mitigation measures and the risk that may occur over the project lifetime such as the technology failure or natural disasters so each and every kind of problem that can happen in future what are the plans that we have in place what are we doing to look and and to avoid all these kind of issues so this is where the impact management part comes into the picture so all these are the first few steps you can say first the screening happens the scoping happens then impact assessment and mitigation happens and then finally impact management strategies will be built so that we have everything in place if at all anything goes wrong if at all there is a chance of a negative impact on the environment or on the ecosystem in the given area on the human population living in that area so all these kind of things have to be done and these few becomes the first few steps of environmental impact assessment now the next step that comes up is eia report now what has happened is that screening has been completed scoping has been completed impact assessment and mitigation has been done and in impact management has been done so now that we have compiled information with respect to each and every of these parts then comes the next part that a comprehensive report with respect to each and every aspect will be created all the social aspects all the environmental aspects each and every piece of information will be compiled will be synthesized and a 
comprehensive report will be presented. Now here one thing is also very important that this report that is presented here is in as non-technical language as possible. It should be in a language that could be understood by normal public that could be circulated and people by and large should be able to read it. So people who do not have the technical know-how of or technical understanding of each and every part of the environmental assessment, they should also be able to read and understand all the things that have been compiled in the report. So that's why a good report is always supposed to be the one which is written in a language which could be understood by the masses. So this is very very important when it comes to the reporting. So this is a kind of you can say a draft report. This is not the final report. This is a kind of draft report because this is where public participation will start now. Public hearing will start now. And we'll see that there will be comments that will come from the people who have technical know-how about the areas. Apart from that, there will be people of that area who will also suggest their recommendations and their suggestions with respect to what has come up in the report. So all the stakeholders, you can say in a way, would be the ones which will now come into the picture and read the entire report. So the report is a compilation of several important project components including the project description, the assessment of the environmental and social impacts, mitigation methods and related management and monitoring plans. So all these kind of things will come into the EIA report now. Then comes the next step that is public consultation. So now the report has been prepared and the report is now ready for it to be analyzed. Analyzed by the experts, analyzed by the specialist of that area and analyzed by the public by and large and especially the public which is a stakeholder of this particular region. So what are the key objectives that we have of such a consultation or review? First to assess the adequacy and quality of the report then take into account all the public comments and then determine if the information that has been provided in the report is sufficient for the final decision to be made and then finally to identify any of the deficiencies that must be addressed before the report can be finally submitted. So these are the four key objectives that we will have for such a consultation whether it's a public consultation or people who are experts in this arena. So all these kind of things will happen with respect to public consultation. So this becomes the next stage and after this stage has been done then comes the next stage and this stage will be of decision making. So when we talk about decision making this is where all the review that has happened, all the comments that have come from people and the experts, they will be taken into account. A discussion will happen over all these points and if required, a certain modification will be done to the previous report that was made. And once this has been done, it goes back for public consultation. Once again, the comments are solicited and once we have these comments, once everything has been approved, then only it moves to the next part. That is now the project has been cleared. Now, it's not necessary that the project will be cleared here because this is decision making. The decision can be a yes or the decision can be a no. So, for example, what can happen? There are three scenarios that you can look at. One, that it is a yes. One, it is a no. And the third, that there are certain modifications that have been suggested. Right? So, for example, here it everything looks to be good. All the public consultation, etc. have been taken into the account. And after that, everyone is on the same page that this project can go ahead. And once this has been done, this will be a yes. And once this is done, the project can start. Then there can be a no. When will there be a no? It will be a no if it seems like the impacts that it will have on the society, the impact that it will have on the environment are going to be detrimental, are going to be irreversible. If these are certain issues which are irreversible or irrevocable, then in that case you will see that this will be a no and maybe the project will be scrapped altogether. For example, let's say you come up with a project, you come up with a polluting project in a national park and that national park already is a very sensitive zone. Then in that case, perhaps you will not be given the clearance after all these steps and it might become a no. Then after that, there is the third that is certain modifications are suggested. That is, we go back to the scoping, we look at what are the things that can be changed. For example, if it can be taken up in a nearby area, if there are certain things that can be stopped, if there are certain reductions that can be done to the project, 
for example there could be an issue with respect to the number of trees which are to be felled and if this number is high and if this can be reduced this will be a suggestion that will go and certain modification can be done in a way that the number of trees now which are being felled can be reduced and then the project can come back with a report so this is the third thing that can happen that all these modifications could be suggested and once these modifications and this have been incorporated it can again be turned into a yes and then the project can go forward so this is the next stage you can say step number 7 for us that is decision making now once this is done there is still one step which is left and that is monitoring so what do we mean by monitoring basically once the project has started so there are certain terms and conditions that we have defined that this is how the project has to run for its entire life cycle that is let's say the amount of sewage that can be produced the amount of land that can be used the amount of particulates that can be released into the air so all these are the different kinds of things that have to be maintained these are the different parameters that might have been already suggested before the start of the project and the project has started on these terms and conditions so there has to be a monitoring that keeps on happening from time to time which gate which caters to all these kind of conditions that were put forward before the project started so that's why when you talk about monitoring it provides data on the environmental and social impact of the project for the whole project cycle just remember this whole project life cycle then as a part of their operations most development project involve regular monitoring of indicators the information collected during monitoring activities helps to ensure that the priorities listed in the environmental management plan mitigation measures and the contingency plans are properly implemented and that these plans and measures are effective in addressing the project's impact so there could be monitoring of all these factors even let's say if you are talking about mining of an ore then the quality of ore that comes out now that also can be managed that also has to be monitored from time to time and as i said how much sewage is being released what impact it has on the air what are the kinds of particulates that are being released into the atmosphere is it under control if let's say the air quality index has been defined as not to go beyond 100 then is the air quality index at any point of time going beyond 100 and if it is then what are the things to be cut off what are the kinds of measures that can be taken so all these are the different kinds of things that will come under the monitoring of clearance conditions so this is the entire process of environmental impact assessment and how it happens so for example let's say a coal mine has been proposed if the coal mine has been proposed in an area which is very very sensitive and probably it's not possible at all to take up the project it will be screened off in the first stage itself in the screening stage only we'll say that we'll see that it will be suggested that it cannot go further but if at all it goes further then comes the second step of scoping where we'll find out what kind of air impact this coal mine will have what kind of impact it will have on the water bodies nearby what kind of impact will it have on the forest in this area on the agricultural fields which are nearby on the people who are living in the vicinity so all these are the things that will come under scoping then comes impact assessment and mitigation we'll look at all the different kinds of impacts with respect to water with respect to land with respect to air and all the mitigation strategies so that all these can be curbed all these negative impacts can be curbed and then comes environmental management plan that what are we going to do with this project over a long period of time how are we going to maintain a proper balance between the societal requirements and the development projects then after that there will be a report that will be published this report goes to the experts as well as the public then there are certain suggestions that come in those suggestions are implemented once it has been implemented it comes to the next stage where decision is made that we are going forward let's say we are going forward with the project and now the coal mine will start to work and then after once it has been done after that there will be a regular monitoring that will happen from time to time to look at all the parameters to look at all the terms and conditions whether the air quality is still good enough whether the water quality is good whether there is any kind of new problems or impacts that has started to arise all these kind of things will come in the last stage of monitoring so this is how the entire process of environmental impact assessment happens